Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. So we've been silent since the news broke uh, in October of last year regarding the allegations of sexual clergy abuse by Mike Bickle over at the International House of Prayer. I've been waiting for all the shoes to drop and things like this and for things to kind of pan out. Because here's the thing. I'll be blunt. Just because there's an allegation against a clergyman doesn't mean the allegation is true. There are people who make false allegations. So you have to wait for these things to kind of develop and for things to happen. That being the case, uh, things have developed. Things have happened. And uh, we're going to note then that... Um, IHOP has officially severed and permanently severed its relationship with Mike Bickle. And we'll look at uh, a portion of the official announcement as to why that is. We'll look at one of the allegations that, uh, that's been made. It seems to be substantiated. Even Mike Bickle himself has admitted to doing something sexually wrong uh, and vagaries regarding details. Uh, but all that being said, I'm going to note... Um, at no point did I ever consider Mike Bickle to be a sound teacher, a true prophet of God, or somebody that was rightly handling God's word. I've always considered him to be somebody to be marked and avoided as a false prophet, as a false teacher who traffics in false signs, false wonders, and false prophecies. And uh, the things that he's said publicly, well, let's just put it this way. People in the past have been unwilling to look with scrutiny and biblical Berean eyes at things that he's said in the past. And uh, my hope now is that uh, we can do a little bit of a postmortem and demonstrate that he was never, and I mean never sound. He was always a deceitful workman. He was always somebody who was a blight and a blemish and somebody who was a heretic. I, I, I don't say that lightly. So let's do this. We're going to whirl up the desktop. And uh, again, Sydney Opera House from back September of last year. Uh, alas, you know, it's it's like sub zero right now here in North Dakota, and it's like oh. Anyway, yeah, I'm just thinking about warm warm thoughts, and and Sydney, Australia was warm at the time. Let's take a look at a portion of the official response. Leadership transition and community update at IHOP Kansas City. Uh, this was put out two weeks ago, and it's officially on the International House of Prayer uh, YouTube channel. And I believe this is Stuart Greaves here uh, from the, uh, the formerly of the leadership team. I think he stepped down after this. And uh, let's listen to the official statement made by IHOP. Here we go. Since taking over management of the crisis, the executive committee has received new information to now confirm a level of inappropriate behavior on the part of Mike Bickle that requires IHOP KC to immediately, formally, and permanently separate from him. People will surely wonder about details, but IHOP KC does not have permission from those individuals to share details while they are being vetted further by an independent investigator. The privacy of any person impacted by misconduct is tantamount. And this only amplifies IHOP KC's conviction that a complete investigation should be conducted into the allegations of clergy abuse by Mike Bickle. General Fuller will ensure that this gets done. Our current focus remains a thorough and complete investigation of the reported allegations, and we pledge to then implement any and all changes necessary to church policies, procedures, and culture to ensure that IHOP KC does not travel down this difficult road again. We have met and plan to continue to meet with the advocate group in an effort to establish trust and common ground, we ask the community to pray for this process. All right. So they've officially, formally, permanently severed ties, and it's based upon actual evidence uh, regarding the allegations of inappropriate sexual clergy abuse. I would note that one particular media outlet um, interviewed one of the Jane Doe's, and uh, Jane Doe, uh, said this, he, Mike Bickle, begins to tell me that the Lord has spoken to him and that Diane is going to die and that we are going to get married, she said. 
It turns out this was a married woman at the time, too. So from 1996 to 1999, Jane Doe said Bickle put her up in an apartment by herself, gave her a key to his office, engaged in sexual interactions with her, and told her about the dream again and again. He also began establishing the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. That line that Diane, his wife, was going to die and that we're going to get married, he said at least said that to me. A hundred times, Doe said. So Mike Bickle, uh, one of the three uh, of the Kansas City prophets, now all three of the Kansas City prophets have um, been publicly outed regarding egregious sexual sins. Um, Yeah, Mike, Mike Bickle being one of the three, all three of them have all fallen. Um, We'll we'll note here, this is absolutely uh, 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 him claiming prophetically that he had been given a dream by God and that this was God's will for him to have this relationship with Jane Doe, which lasted from 96 to 99. And there are other victims with similar stories. So uh, we've, we've got a problem here. And so at this point, I would say those who were unwilling in the past to actually look at the evidence, maybe you'll be willing to take a look at the hard evidence regarding Bickle now. And that is is that y'all should have seen this coming. And, uh, And quite frankly, I wasn't surprised when I heard the story break. I wasn't surprised at all. Uh, there's, there. I hate to say this, but uh, enough people in the NAR who've left the NAR have sent me emails over the decades, uh, letting me know about the dirty laundry that that takes place sexually in the NAR. And uh, I've heard so many stories like this that. Um, it doesn't surprise me. The thing is, is I can't go public with them uh, because I'm not an investigative journalist. I that's not my lane. So you know, I do theology, apologetics, and and things like that. But um, yeah, going in and and actually doing the hard work of substantiating sexual allegations. That's that's not in the uh, the purview of fighting for the faith. It's not my bailiwick. But let's just say that I have hundreds, if not thousands of emails over the past couple of decades with stories similar to this. And uh, so this kind of stuff just doesn't surprise me anymore. And it definitely didn't surprise me regarding Bickle. So why would I say that this is this? Sh- everybody should have seen this coming? The reason why they should have seen this coming is because of Mike Bickle and the things he's said it in his own public ministry. And so we're going to walk through some things. We'll do some biblical comparison along the way as we uh, we consider Mike Bickle. So I'm going to note, um, we're going to look first at a teaching given by Mike Bickle. I do not have the date stamp on when this was preached, but in this particular case, Mike Bickle is going to, oddly enough, work his way through a biblical text relating to false teachers, false prophets, and cult leaders. And the biblical text is clear enough that he doesn't twist the text. But what he says, let's just say uh, we'll be able to judge him based on his own words. Let's uh, let's listen to Mike Bickle. This is not horrible what he's going to say. What he's going to say is correct. But given in light of what we're hearing now as, as coming out, this is interesting. Let's let's listen in. Tonight we're going to talk about discerning false teachers and cults, which is one of the enemy's number one attacks on intimacy with God, is to bring deception, to get people with a false devotion and a false loyalty in, other, in, in order to cut off the loyalty to Jesus. Father, we come to you even now. We ask you for the spirit of truth. We ask you for the spirit of revelation. We ask you to exalt Jesus in our hearts. And in our midst, in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 5, I mean, verse... Good text. Four. It's talking about the end times. Yep. And Jesus said, in context to the end times, just uh, take heed that no one deceives you. And I'm going to take it a step further. It's not just that you would not be deceived, but you would 
be uh, engaged in this for the, for the people that you love, that they would not be deceived. It's not enough just to avoid deception. We want others to avoid deception. Verse 5, for many will come in my name. And I want you to catch how many times the word many is used in this passage. They'll say I'm the Christ. They will deceive many. So there's multitudes of people who are getting swept away. By now, I, I would add to his exegesis. The, uh, when Christ says there will be many claiming he's the Christ, there would also be many false Christ, uh, pseudo Christoi in the Greek. Uh, and Christos in, in, in Greek means an anointed one. So people claiming special anointings actually fall under the category of Christ's because that's actually what the word means. D just keep that in mind. Deception. Again, it's the enemy's attack against intimacy with Jesus. And so verse 11, many false prophets will arise. And again, they will deceive many. They'll get many people to follow after them. Verse 24, false Christs and false prophets will arise, which, and they'll show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And the elect can be deceived if they're not careful, but it's not, it's not difficult to avoid deception. Matter of fact, the primary way that we avoid deception, not the only way, I'll give you a couple one, two, threes at the end, but they're really self-evident because the, the, the weakest and newest believer can avoid deception if they want to. But the primary way is to shine the light of understanding, to expose the deception. It's going to get real specific here. I want to point out two different, two main characteristics of false teachers or false prophets. And All right, so now he's going to focus on the characteristics of false teachers and false prophets. And he's going to speak correctly. It's just kind of ironic. These are the two things that uh, cults are built around, these two tendencies in leadership. Verse 3. By covetousness, they will exploit you. They will trick you and manipulate you by appealing to covetousness and by their own covetousness. They'll uh, they exploit you with, decep with deceptive words. Verse 14. They will exploit you with deceptive words. Note that phrase. They will de exploit you with deceptive words. Talking about the false teachers, they have eyes full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. Their heart is trained in covetousness. Verse 18, when they speak, they speak great swelling words. I mean, great, grand words, but it's emptiness, Peter said. Emptiness, correct. False teachers speak emptiness. They are windbags. They engage in windbaggery. They speak empty words, not the sound, wholesome words of, of Christ in the scriptures. They allure people through lust and through lewdness. It's talking about particularly sexual immorality. So the two most easily detected signs of a false prophet not the only two but the two that shout at you is a covetousness money is a really important thing in their life for their own personal lives and lewdness or immorality they find a way to preach the word in a way that actually allows and promotes illicit behavior among even the, the people in the group and some of them are the saints actually because some of the saints get caught into this kind of stuff right like you know Mike Bickle telling Jane Doe that the Lord had spoken to him, thus saith the Lord, that his wife Diane is going to die and that they are going to get married. And as a result of that, they were engaging in sexual interactions. You know, like that. But in number five here, the dishonoring of the family unit, number one, the cults. Now, this is really, really uh, perverse. But children in cults are taught to be more loyal to the leaders than their parents. Yeah. Equally perverse, even more intense, women are taught to be more loyal to the leaders than their husbands. And even more bizarre than that, husbands are taught to accept those two things as normative. And the vast majority of ministry cultures, that would be so obvious. That it doesn't even be worth, you don't even have to say it. But I've seen some good guys get close to that line. Number two, the first relational priority is to one's... If they were good guys, why would they ever get close to that line? Marriage, one's children, and one's parents. Our identity in our family, it has to be more important than our identity in our ministry. I am first Mike Bickle. I have a wife and I have a family. That is my first identity, not just the leader of a ministry. It's an important reality. In turn, identity means what, the way I see myself. I don't see myself first as a guy that gives Bible teachings. I see myself first as a guy who loves Jesus. That's the first anointing or grace I want to operate in. Then I want to be a faithful man in my family. And then I want to work with a diligent work ethic to serve others in the ministry here and outside the ministry here. Okay, no well, we know he wasn't a faithful man. 
in his marriage. Number, top of page four. Coming to the end of this. Number six. The crossing of biblical boundaries in behavior. Cults do this. And the two main issues, not the only two, but the two main ones, they really stick out. It's the two I mentioned earlier from Second Peter, immorality and covetousness. It's money and sexual immorality. This is the main issue. Cult leaders, it's typically only the top leaders, but it does trickle down some. They emphasize special revelation where God told me, by special revelation, they can cross boundary lines of immorality. You know, like telling Jane Doe, the Lord told me that that his wife, Diane, is going to die and that the two of them were going to get married. <sighs> this is, this is again, the biblical text is clear. You, you'll note that the, uh, God's word is judging him. He's rightly identifying the problem, but this would have been a call for him to repent, and he didn't. And actually, more of that's happening in the last couple decades. It's kind of, it's on the increase, where guys are, they're teaching the grace of God in a way where they're crossing boundary lines morally. Yeah, that, that's true. All right. So, I think we get the idea here. And you'll note that when you compare Mike Bickle's teaching and his actions to the Word of God, he comes up really short. But I am going to point this out. He was never sound. He I, never, ever sound. I think back to these videos that we covered on a previous installment of Fighting for the Faith uh, that are 11 years old. And boy, when these interviews came out on YouTube, everybody was buzzing and talking about them because of the insanely nonsensical stuff that uh, Mike Bickle was saying. So Mike Bickle being, uh, you know, I, I let's just put it bluntly, he's he is definitely in the New Apostolic Reformation. There's just no, whether he denies it, it that I don't care if he denies it, 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 how it's, he's legitimately a leader within the New Apostolic Reformation. That being the case, he's a big advocate for signs, wonders, miracles, and prophecies and stuff like this. But when he did these videos, okay, uh, one of the one of the interviews was on Ask Mike Bickle, Are Dreams and Visions and Visitations Higher Than the Word of God? That was the name of the video. The things that he said can't be squared with Scripture at all. And unfortunately, it's far too many people who are charismatics just don't know their Bibles. That's just the reality of the situation. They, uh, they absolutely think that he's speaking pious truth to them. But we're we're gonna we're gonna tear this apart here shortly, um, and we're gonna tear a few things apart in in ways that people may not expect. Let's let's kind of let Mike Bickle spin a few things out here. Here we go. And I believe that a whole lot of the dreams and visions aren't even real. I mean, even though the people are genuine lovers of God. Note, he's saying that within the charismatic movement, even at IHOP. The vast majority of dreams and visions that people are putting forward as prophecies from God, he says they're not real. They're not real. So this sermon where we listen to a portion of you know, Bickle talking, talking about, for, about Second Peter and Matthew 24, talking about false teachers speaking emptiness, by Mike Bickle's own admission, the vast majority of prophecies, dreams, and visions being spoken about in the charismatic movement are not real. They are empty words. According to the biblical standard, that would mean that these are deceivers and false teachers and false prophets. Let me back this up just a little bit. Listen to the Great listen Commission again. to love the Bible more, not to have some category outside the Bible. And I believe that a whole lot of the dreams and visions aren't even real. I mean, even though the people are genuine lovers of God, and even though they might have a history of having some dreams and they actually came to pass the things they saw, I have I know many people that have had you know seen some things in dreams, and then had hundreds of dreams. I don't know the number, of course, multitudes of dreams that were not prophetic at all. They were just pizza, and they were not helpful. They were actually, and, but because they had two or three or four or five or ten dreams where there were helpful information that ended up being valid and from God, that doesn't mean the next hundred are right. You know, you know, there, there's a verse. In ten correct, a hundred wrong. That's like ninety plus percent wrong. What? How? How does this square with Scripture? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I think it's chapter 7, that says, or chapter 5, that with many dreams, there's emptiness and vanity. 
I don't take my direction by dreams. I'm open to a dream giving me direction, but it has to be confirmed without, meaning I have to have the dream, you have to have the dream, another guy have the dream, and they tell me, and I haven't even told them I have to have that dream. Then I pay a little bit more attention. It has to honor the biblical principles. I get probably, uh, I don't know how many dreams or visions sent to me from because of the internet around the world, email, or even people from our city that aren't a part of IHOP and people part of IHOP. And most of them I don't pay attention to. I, I just think they're distraction. I think they're not real. I don't mean the people aren't real. Some of them are faking it. Now there's a lot of people faking it. But even good people just have dumb stuff. It's just dumb. A lot of people in the charismatic movement faking it. And by his account, we're talking like 80, 90% which means 10 to 20% by his admission of dreams, prophecies, and visions are real, the remainder are not. Does that make a lick of sense? How is Christ glorified um, by a 90% false prophecy rate? How does this enhance the gospel? How does this help the gospel to be proclaimed? This doesn't make a lick of sense. Let's do a little biblical work here. All right. So we're going to note here, and this is where I'm going to make a big, uh, let's just say a, a big statement. And I'm going to make the statement that Mike Bickle is a heretic. And he is a heretic by virtue of the fact that he has a false Holy Spirit. Now work with me on the categories here. In in the history of the Christian church, there has been heretical controversies related to Christology. So you, you would think back to the Arian heresy, right? Arius was a heretic. Arius taught that Jesus isn't God in human flesh, but and that he isn't eternal, but that Jesus is the greatest creation of God, that he's a God-like divine-ish being, but he isn't second person of the Trinity in human flesh. That's what Arius taught. And, uh, and so his heresy, called the Arian heresy, uh, was a Christological heresy. And the church argued that Arius was a heretic on the basis of texts similar to the ones I'm going to read here. Uh, so, for instance, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul says, I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I feel a divine jealousy, jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different heteros, heteros spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. And so Paul's not con 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 commending them, he's condemning them. And this then kind of creates, you know, at least a basis then for looking at how we distinguish not just error, but heresy from Christianity. Different Jesus, different spirit, different gospel, okay? Any one of those would knock you out of the park, all right? And, and in Bickle's case, we're going to note, I'm going to document that he not only has a different spirit, he has a different gospel. I know that's going to sound crazy, but I'll show you, all right? And, and so Paul here in 2 Corinthians then goes on to condemn the, uh, the church of Corinth and basically make it clear that uh, the, the end of the people who are these so-called super apostles who have a different spirit, a different Jesus, a different gospel, he says um, that such men, verse 13, are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants all also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. Galatians chapter 1, Paul writing against the Judaizing heresy, the, the, writing against the Judaizers, says to the churches in Galatia, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. N not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we 
or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The, the Greek word for accursed is anathema. And uh, another valid translation of anathema is damned. So if you believe in a different gospel, that different gospel not only cannot save you, it damns you. You believe in a different Jesus, that Jesus cannot save you, that Jesus will damn you. You believe in a different spirit. Again, 2 Corinthians 11. That Holy Spirit is, that, that is a pneumatological heresy. And like Christological heresies, 2 Corinthians 11 argues that that makes you a heretic, not a Christian brother. And so we've got a big problem here with Mike Bickle. And that is this. He is claiming that the Holy Spirit that he believes in will give valid prophecies 10% of the time in a culture where 90% of the words spoken in the name of God, thus saith the Lord, are false. Yet the scripture is clear that that is a breaking of one of God's commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. That means to carry God's name into emptiness or false prophecy. That's what that means. And so in the culture of IHOP, by Mike Bickle's own admission, in the culture of the wider charismatic movement, 80 to 90 percent of the words that are given in the name of the Lord as prophecy are false. This is a culture where people are taught to break this commandment in Exodus 20 verse 7 with no conscience, with no ramifications, with no accountability. And he then believes that God, the Holy Spirit, will still, in that culture, where they are constantly, habitually, uh, and incessantly breaking this commandment, that God, the Holy Spirit, will still give valid prophecies. That makes no sense. That's a different Holy Spirit altogether. A completely different spirit altogether. And that's not the Holy Spirit of Scripture. That's a different spirit. And I'd say probably 80% of what I hear, I throw it away. Does it move me at all? Does it bear witness to me? I still like the guy. I believe in his walk with God, but I don't believe what he says from God. You know, the dream. Same with healings. I think there's... <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you still think he's a Christian brother, but he's impenitently breaking one of the Ten Commandments. How do you figure there's a lot of healings out there that are really real. I've seen them with my eyes. A lot of people report healings, and you look back a year later, it was, they weren't real. Was it a lie? Some people lie. They just lie. Yeah, like the show me the toes lady that uh, Bill Johnson uh, promoted. About healings. Other people feel pressured, so they say they're healed when they're not. Other people genuinely feel good. They feel better. Two days, and then you check in a month or two later. Well, what was that? I don't know. But there are real healings. It's exciting. So every healing testimony that I, from our own people, do I believe it? No. Do I feel pressured to believe it? No. Do I throw out all healing? No. <laughs> Does this sound like a guy who's grounded in the scriptures? Who's rightly handling God's word? He, he, you'll note that when he preached from the text uh, here, he identified what the text said and gave the real standard and talked about how false prophets speak words that are empty then he cannot even make the connection to the people in his own movement at his own church that he's supposedly pastoring. Huh. Are you starting to see it now? Is it any wonder that this man was using prophecy for the purpose of um, sexually exploiting women, plural, at IHOP? The Lord spoke to me and said, Diane's going to die and we're going to get married. Uh-huh. Maybe that should be chalked up. You know, the, the women should have said, oh, sorry, Mike. I mean, that's probably in the 80% of false prophecies. That, but we still consider you a Christian brother. <laughs> Different spirit altogether. There are healings. So I believe in prophecies, dreams, visions, healings. 
I've seen the manifestations of the Holy Spirit so powerful, so real, some of them bizarre, but real. I've seen a lot of people fake them in our community. Healings, dreams, visions, all that stuff. But you know what I do? I am so zealous for the real. I'm so hungry for the real. Why would God the Holy Spirit give the real in a culture that is incessantly breaking one of his 10 commandments about taking his name in vain? Why would God give real manifestations of the Holy Spirit and real healings in a context of a bunch of people faking it and lying? That makes no sense because then God would be giving validity to a church where 80 to 90% of the things spoken and done in the name of the Lord are lies and fake. That makes no sense. That doesn't sound anything like the God of the Bible. That I don't get offended by what I call the hamburger helper. The, the added it extra. Some people fake them blatantly. Some people don't fake them. They're genuinely seeking them, but still the experience isn't real, though the people are genuine. There's all kinds of categories, but I am not throwing away the real because humans are involved and there's some of that other stuff. And so I tell people the, I think the wrong approach is it's either 100% right or 100% wrong. I go, I wish it was that easy. It is. It's either f the word is from God or it isn't. And if it's not from God, the person has broken one of God's Ten Commandments and needs to repent. It's that simple. When you give false words that you claim are from God, God condemns you as speaking presumptuously and will judge you accordingly if you don't repent. But he just glosses it over. Does this sound at all biblical to you? Oh, you know, humans are messy and stuff like that. <laughs> what on earth? See, you see... You can see this now through a different lens because the facade has broken off and we can see the true Mike Bickle. We continue. So I tell the charismatic guys who believe every healing, every dream, every vision, every prophecy, every manifestation, every, you know, gold dust is in the room. They believe every single one of them. I go, I go, don't be so open-minded. Your brains fall out. Use some discernment. A lot of that is fake. Did you tell that to the women that you said that God told you that your wife was going to die? False, meaning not even real. The guys are lying. And other guys are more meaning, but they're exaggerating or they're trying to make it work and it's not real. I go, don't be so open-minded your brains fall out. Use some discernment. A lot of that's real, fake. But you know what? I tell the other guys who can see the fake, don't throw all that away. Because <laughs> I tell you, there's real visions, real dreams. Not really from the Lord. Not in a place where 90, 80 to 90 percent of it's all faked and is lies. Why would God the Holy Spirit give any validation where his name is being dragged through the mud and taken in vain day after day, week after week, year after year? It's real healings, real manifestations. And so in our community, we try to value the real, use discernment to the fake, but without a critical spirit. And when we see the fake... No critical spirit, despite the fact that Christ says <laughs> false Christ and false prophets are end up in the, in the fires of hell, and that we are to mark and avoid those who do not stay within the bounds of Scripture. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what the Scripture don't says. Don't be heavy about it. Just be soft and kind about it. And don't, don't... Where in Scripture it says to be soft and kind to people who are faking words from God and faking miracles? make a big point about it. And so we try to live in the tension because we're so hungry for the real and we see the real, we see it regularly and I love it. I don't think you saw the real ever there. Because it makes people love Jesus more, obey the Bible more, obey, Je not just love. Yeah, did you obey Jesus more because of your love for the real? I mean, you know, I mean, what, what did you say? The Lord told you Diane was gonna die and that this woman that you were, sexually uh, in, engaged with in some degree or interacting with. Um, yeah, did, 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 did your love for the real help you obey Jesus more in that regard? Jesus obey him, more effective in the gospel and the Great Commission and missions, giving their money away, more generous, more steadfast under persecution, more steadfast under trials. I like that. That's what I call good fruit. <laughs> yeah, not good fruit. Different Holy Spirit altogether, and the, 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 his practices contradict the clear instruction and commands of the Word of God related to false teachers and false prophets. So he believes in a different Holy Spirit altogether. And I'm going to note then that he also believes in a different gospel. I, again, do not know the year that this was preached, but this is an interesting one. In this particular sermon, 
Mike Bickle is going to claim a prophetic word from the Lord, specifically for IHOP Kansas City, that is altogether a different gospel. And that is not an overstatement. That is not hyperbole. That is not me being a hypercritic or a meanie poopy head. That is that is the correct assessment of what it is that we're going to hear. And this is fascinating. So since we know now that Mike Bickle has been engaging in this type of sexual predatory behavior using the prophetic, the claims of prophetic words from God, especially that his wife Diane was going to die in order to troll for women in his uh, congregation. And this took place over decades not just in the 90s. This took place over decades. There's a problem, and that is is that Mike Bickle was leading a double life the entire time. Even when he preached this, he was pre- he was living a double life. And here's the question I would have then. He knows full well that he is transgressing God's law. What's the solution then? You'll, you'll note that when we sin against Christ, when we sin against each other as well, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is that Christ has died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. How many of them? All of them. Christ has bled and died for all of our sins. That being the case, the gospel has to be the solution for any Christian that is struggling with an, uh, a guilty conscience or wrestling with the guilt of sins that they've committed in their past. This gospel has to be the thing that is brought forward. Let me, let me give you some biblical texts along these lines. So, for instance, in the book of Colossians, um, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Colossians here because I want you to see kind of the fuller context. Paul writing to the church at Colossae says, so from the day that we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So note, uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 clearly states that God the Father has qualified Christians to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. How has he qualified us? Through the shed blood of Christ, Christ has died for our sins. Note then, God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. That's what Christ bled and died for. In Christianity, the center focus is Christ and him crucified for our sins. And in Jesus, we have the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, You'll note that verse 19 of chapter 1 says this, For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, talking about Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed to you, proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. So, You'll note that as Christians, we keep an emphasis on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to hear the gospel week after week, day after day, right? And it's through the gospel that we then are to remain steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the forgiveness of our sins. Paul then in Colossians 2 says... um, Uh, I'll start in verse six. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, conduct your life in Christ, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. And see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and, watch this word, empty deceit 
you'll, again, this note, the false teachers are waterless rain clouds. They speak empty words. And we are instructed by God, the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul in the, in the scriptures to not be taken captive by empty deceit. Yet Mike Bickle has made it clear that 80 to 90% of the prophetic words given at IHOP are in fact this, empty words, empty deceit. I continue, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. For in Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has has made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Note what the text says. In Christ, we have been forgiven how many of our trespasses? All of them. The gospel addresses that specifically. Having having forgiven us all of our trespasses, how? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. If you were to think of it, you know, all of your sins being written in a book, Christ has taken that entire book of transgressions and has nailed that book to the cross. The entire record of debt that stood against you has been canceled. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. First John puts it this way. If we Christians, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, that's the he here, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the, the, the people that I pastor, when they come to me struggling with sin or struggling with guilt related to sin, what do I point them to? The cross of Christ and the forgiveness of sins that is freely offered to all Christians who confess their sins, and they get to hear that they are forgiven. And they don't have to confess their sins to me. They can confess their sins to Christ directly. The point is, is that when we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can go to the bank on those promises that we are forgiven in Christ. Jesus and him crucified for our sins is the solution for our guilty conscience, for our, the forgiveness of our sins, and it's the only one given. But I want you to hear what Mike Bickle is about to preach. And I apologize for the audio levels on this. They're not good. And the reason why they're not good is because this is kind of a whistleblower who put this account together. And they they don't have the, the ability to to rightly do the video work to, you know, on this. And so they recorded it, it you know, in a way that the audio sounds a little tinny. But uh, here's the setup. Mike Bickle has a guilty conscience because he's been using his prophetic ministry to engage in sexual clergy abuse, telling his victims that God has told him that his wife Diane's going to die and that it's okay for them to be together in sexual interactions because, because of that. That's what's going on behind the scenes here. So what's his solution? Well, this is a prophetic word where he claims that God is giving IHOP a special grace of immunity. L listen in. This is this is weird. It will be helping us get liberated. And what the Lord put in my heart, paragraph F, very important, it's very important. I had a number of you comment to me this week because I mentioned this uh, on Monday. The Lord said, from this day forward, I will release the grace of immunity. That's a, that's a tricky phrase. 
so he's exegeting a prophetic word that he claims that God gave him, that God is going to be releasing the grace of immunity. This is a different gospel. Listen to this. It's a phrase that has levels of meaning. It's a phrase that takes some thinking. I will release the grace of immunity from this day forward in this community. This is a, this is a personal word for this season. It's a, it's a personal word that applies for now in this setting. He says that they will repent not only of immorality, of tolerating immorality. Some of you are not involved in anything remotely. So God's saying to the folks at IHOP, if they will repent of immorality and tolerance of immorality, then they are letting them, then they are in line to receive the grace of immunity. That touches us, but it doesn't trouble you that others are. You know, God's not calling us to be a police state. That's not what he's calling us to be. But he's calling us to be, to carry his heart in us. He says, I'm going to give the grace of immunity. Now that includes amnesty. The Lord says, I will cover I will cover yesterday in this community. The Lord told you that he would cover yesterday in the community at IHOP. Isn't that what Christ bled on the cross for? Isn't reconciliation with God and forgiveness of our sins and full pardon offered to all Christians via the vicarious penal substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross? What is this grace of immunity that you say that God is offering the folks over at IHOP? This is a counterfeit, substitute, false gospel. And here's why this is important. This is a critical point. He wants us to go forward, read this, with confidence. He wants us to go forth with confidence in our work and morality. This confidence, the next paragraph, is essential to spiritual vitality. He wants us to enjoy the immunity that comes from the accumulated power of our shame of the fear of rejection, you know, there's this guy or that guy going, you know, I can't go forward. I, I'm stuck. This word paralyzes me, Mike. I, I would love to rejoice in this word, but I have secrets. This word terrifies me. I want to quit. I can't go forward, forward in boldness. I can't go to the communion table and rejoice. I got to get out of here. This terrifies me. The Lord says, no, there's immunity. I don't want, which includes amnesty. I don't want you coming to my presence afraid of yesterday. I will cover you. But he has already covered us through the shed blood of Christ. What is this grace of immunity thing that you've concocted and made up in your own mind? I don't want you fearing you're going to be rejected because of yesterday. I don't want you in the shame. I don't want you letting go of a high calling. Many people have been doing stuff in the last weeks, months, or years, whatever, and they said, my high calling is out of reach. The Lord says, no. I want you free from that diseased way of mind. It's an infected mindset. I'm covering you. I will give you as a family a new beginning. He says, tell them. He gives all Christians a new beginning. What is this? The grace of immunity, which means the, the sins of yesterday in this regard, as we stand in solidarity as a family, the Lord is saying, I will cover you. They don't need to go to the platform afraid. I will cover you. Um, <laughs> this is a different gospel. It, it is completely a different gospel. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. We have this in Jesus. Why aren't you proclaiming Christ? Why aren't you pro pointing them to the cross? Why are you pointing to them, them to this direct revelation, this so-called prophecy that you had, claiming that, that the people in your community have special immunity and, and, and stuff like that, and uh, the, the grace of immunity, and uh, it's just, this is nonsense. This is a totally different gospel altogether. Mm-hmm. I want everybody undistracted because you'll never connect with me if you're caught up under the infection of the fear of yesterday, the shame of it, the hopelessness. I have no fear of my sins of yesterday. They're covered in Christ. The hopelessness of yesterday will keep us from connecting with the Lord today. It really will. The fear of, of yesterday, the, the skeletons of the closet, will keep us from encountering the Lord. It'll be, Lord Jesus, here I am. I said, I love you and your beauty. I received it. He was like, Lord, I promise I won't do that. If you do this, I won't do that. It's all negotiating. The Lord says, no, you need immunity from the disease of yesterday's sins and yesterday. The sad tragedy here is that he, he needed true immunity from his sins and forgiveness. And rather than looking to the gospel, 
he's looking to this false prophecy, which gives a false gospel and no comfort at all. Yesterday's errors. And as a community, he is saying, I want you to go forward undistracted and clean from the infection of yesterday's defilement. I don't want it in you because you won't be able to get free tomorrow if this is weighing on you. Because we're this is not a word of the Lord. This is a false gospel from a false Holy Spirit. We're going after this thing hard. And the one thing the Lord does not want is shame and fear of rejection in the way he wants connection with his heart. That's what he wants. And you can't connect with his heart if you're negotiating 10 other things. You don't need to negotiate. Christ has bled and died for all of your sins and canceled the entire record of debt that stood against us by nailing it to the cross. He says, tell them the grace of immunity. It includes amnesty. Because as a people, we're going forward in an intentional way. Monday, about a thousand of them. Okay, you, you get the idea. That, that, that's a different gospel altogether. This, this man was never a true prophet, ever. He was never a sound teacher, ever. And here's the thing. People should have been able to spot that based upon his teaching first. But because they get completely gave him a pass regarding his false teaching and his false prophecies and his false gospel and his false Holy Spirit, you know what it took to out him? His victims. And unfortunately, there are victims, plural, women who have been sexually exploited in the name of the Lord by the false prophet, <clears throat> Mike Bickle. And uh, we, like I said, I'm not surprised by any of this. Saw it coming. And I'm surprised it took this long to, for this to come out. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And a quick shout out and a thank you for those of you who support Fighting for the Faith financially. You make it possible for us to do what we are doing here. And I want to thank you for your support of, of this ministry and the work that we're doing and comparing what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. If you would like to join our crew and support us financially, there's a link down below that'll take us take you to our website where you can join our crew and, uh, and select Select your monthly uh, donation that you would like to support us because that is what makes it possible for us to keep doing what we're doing. Thank you. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen.